Welcome to a new Breed of Golf Live. Michael Breed here, week after Masters. Tell me that wasn't a great week. Phenomenal play. Congratulations to John Rahm. Um, if you didn't get a chance to hear Dave Phillips on my radio show this morning on Sirius XM and a new breed of golf, you can catch him this Sunday on CBS. We're doing a uh, course record at 1.30. Uh, that final round coverage will start at 3, so we're not quite leading into that, but nearly. But you can catch a really nice conversation with Dave Phillips on all the little different things that are going on in the in the game of golf. we got a great show lined up for you today. Before we get to that, though, let me tell you about a couple little different things. You know about our blessed poker chips right now. It's golf season for everybody. 80 degrees is, is the norm nowadays. We're fired up to be able to get out there and play a little golf. You want to mark your golf ball. You want to have some birdies. You want to have a blessed poker chip. It's right here. Six bucks. Send an email to me at a new breed of golf at michaelbreed.com. And we can put you into that. Also, too, by the way, we've got our hats in. And I've got, we've got the white ones with a new breed of golf. Be a part of the community. I got a great email from Michael Sweet. He wants the tan one. Michael, we will take care of that. We'll get everybody on a new breed of golf to sign it for you. And we'll get that down to you. If you want to get one of these hats, just send an email to me at a new breed of golf at michaelbreed.com. They're very inexpensive. They're less than the cost of a master's hat which you'll be happy about. Now, let me introduce you to the people who are really making all this magic happen. Uh, Steve Gibbs and Greg Ducharme. What are we going to get? Are we going to get a high five? Are we going to pound? What are we going to Oh, we get a low oh, five today. Two. A double dip, a throwback. It's a throwback. It's throwback Thursday. Hard to believe that. But anyway, Gibbs, he's running the board. Greg is going to get to some of your questions. Whatever questions that you've got, make sure you get those to us. We're going to talk a little bit about trail wrist angles, how it's going to help you uh, gain a little bit of distance, gain a lot of consistency, and certainly gain some predictability in the distance that you're hitting the golf ball. Whether it's a six iron, which is what I have here, or any club, one of the most important things about great iron play, which is a, a key this week at the RBC Heritage, you have to control distance to be a great iron player. And I'll explain to you why you don't and why you can by understanding what's going on with uh, the trail wrist angle. Now, before we get to that, though, we got to keep you up to date as to what's going on with the RBC Heritage. I know Ricky Fowler got off to a really good start. Greg, where does uh, where does where does Ricky stand now? He was at three under at one point. Ricky is two under through fourteen, uh, along with Matt Kuchar's at two under. Davis Love the third is at two under. Loves this place. Justin Thomas is two under. Yep. Um, but the lead right now is six under. You got Brian Harmon up there at six under through fifteen holes. You got Joel Damon and Matt Fitzpatrick and Ben Martin at five under leading nice. the way. Yeah, it's watch a good out. start to the tournament. I'm telling you, watch out for my guy, Justin Rose. He hasn't started. What time does JR uh, go today? He's got to be after one, like 116 or something. I, I do think he's in that range. He's I, one o'clock, I think. Uh, um, I and, feel like I'm close to him here. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, 117, 117. So I was close 116. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's kind of like price is right. You got to get the right number. Just be underneath. Right. So, but Jr. I think is going to have a, a really good tournament. You like Patrick Cantlay this week as well. I do. And also too, it'll be interesting to see the bounce back that Scotty Scheffler has. So we'll keep you up to date with all that as we go. And then remind you that uh, again, you can enjoy course record. Greg and I will be doing that. That'll be on CBS on Sunday. Now I want to talk to you about how you can improve the wrist angle, the consistency of your trail wrist angle. But I want to talk to you about the, the instructional device that's going to help you do it. This is a gear tie. That's what this is. Gibbsy, if you want it, yeah, there you go. So here's the gear tie right here. This is a two-foot gear tie. Now let me show you how you're going to make this device to help you with the trail wrist angle. What you're going to first do is you're going to bend this in half. So now we're taking a two-footer and we're making it into a one-footer. So we're going to go like that. Then about three, four inches down the line, you're going to start twisting this. And I want you to give this three good twists. So we do one, two, and then three. So right now you got it twisted nicely, just like that. Then what I want you to do is I want you to take this and you're going to stretch this out. Push that down just like that. You're almost, it's almost going to feel like you're making a heart out of that. So that's what that's going to look like right there. Then we're going to straighten this up this way. Straighten up this this way. This is one of the best ones that I've ever done, by the way. And then you're going to put that on the trail wrist just like that, and you're going to wrap it around like this. So you wrap it like that. Then you're going to throw a little twist in here. So you do one twist, and then 
you're going to push it down like that so it doesn't interfere. So that's what you're going to have. Now, once you have this, what I want you to do is I want you to take this part and we're going to bend this back just a little bit like that. So I'm going to force the trail wrist to go back and contact that, touch that. So you're going to bend it back just a little bit and you'll feel it because there's going to be, there's a range of motion that your wrist will have that will allow you to touch it. You want to stretch it to that point right there. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to hold the club like this. And when you go into the backswing and you get up to here, what you're going to do is you're going to really reach for that, that position. And what you're going to feel is you're going to feel a cupping in that, in that wrist. You're going to feel the golf club is going to be, it'll feel laid off. It's not going to be laid off, but it's going to feel laid off. And it's going to feel like John Rahm, who, who it, at the top of his swing, we all pay attention to the lead wrist. But if you look at the trail wrist, it is really cupped bent back that fashion. And then what he does and what great players do is they maintain that angle for a very long time into the downswing. I'm going to show you how to do that in just a second. But what you're going to do is this. So you make a backswing. You feel that touch. So down the line, they're perfect. So you feel that touch right there. And now you can see the club and the head of the golf club through the shaft, through the hand, and into the shoulder is all on one straight line there. I won't do that when I'm making a swing, but I'll do that in the practice. So we go back here like this. Feel that right there. That feels like that. Now, what you're going to do when you go up there is you're going to get that position and keep it and then come down. Okay? So all we're doing is we're getting used to that position of the touch. If you go up here and you roll the wrist this way and you bend your wrist like this and you cup the lead wrist, that's going to bow the trail wrist and it, your trail wrist will never be anywhere near that gear tie there, okay? So, up like this, touch, feel that, and then you come right down and make that, that strike. And what will happen is when you do that, you're actually going to take the club face and when you get to the top, it's going to be more pointing to the sky then pointing down. This is one of the things I talk about all the time. So important for you to get that club face under control. And in the backswing, that's how you're going to do it. So you get up there and you feel that. Now, let me record this because I think I, I know what I'm doing, but we're going to find out here in a second. And this is one of the things that I recommend that you do. Get your, um, get your phone, get that V1 app. Make sure that you're, you're um, monitoring your improvement in your swing with that. So here we go. Now, let's just see how we did. I didn't even tell Gibbsy, but you're probably going to need, yeah, there you go. So here we go. So club goes back. Good position, forearm rotation. Club gets up to here. This is, this is looking almost exactly like I want it to look. That, that, I will tell you, I'm not just saying that, that is, that's textbook of what I'm looking for. I want that, if I draw a line through that, down the forearm into the shoulder right there, you can see that it's all kind of touching. You go across the line there, now all of a sudden you can get into some real problems and it creates sometimes a little bit too much of a lay down. That's one of the things that I was struggling with and how I ended up with this because I started messing around with this and all of a sudden I start saying, man, this looks great for me. I'm doing it just the way Rombo does it or it feels like that. It doesn't look like that, but it feels like that for me. And that's one of the things that you're trying to do is you're trying to create these feels. And all of a sudden now I have the club in the position that I want. Let me erase this. And now as we start to come down here, I look for a couple other things. And one of the things that I'm looking for is, is that golf club coming down on the shaft plane that I wanted? So there's impact. Now I go to the address position, go up here like this. Now I'll bring that up to the top, and as I start to come down, and this is one of the positions that I'm looking for at the top of the swing, by the way, I want the trail elbow to sit right on that shaft plane. Now, it might not seem to you like, well, if, if I do this with my wrist, are you telling me I'm going to get that? That's exactly what I'm telling you. There's sort of one thing, the, the, the effect of keeping that is going to put that elbow into a different position. So if I let my wrist kind of kind of float a little bit and go this way. My elbow might, might rise a bit. I don't have that connection between my tricep and my rib cage on my trail side. 
Well, now when I do that with my wrist, my elbow is going to kind of fall down underneath and all of a sudden it sits on that shaft plane line. The other thing that you're going to notice is, is that with the forearm and this initial shaft plane line, they're pretty parallel, which is exactly what I'm trying to see. And then what I want is I want that club face to be just a little bit closed to that line. Doesn't mean I'm going to hit a hook necessarily, but, but what I don't want it to do is I don't want that toe to hang down. So I want all the mass of the golf club, which you can see here, all the mass of the club is on that side, the right side, as we look at it, of the shaft. So all these things that I'm looking for, it's exactly what I'm hoping to get. So let me draw, redraw this shaft plane here. So that's about there. I go up to the top and now I start to come down and you're going to see this uh club head get on that line right there now it's touching exactly what i want it to do and now depending on the shot shape that i'm looking for i want that club to be just a little bit above it or just a little bit below it or right on it i don't want massive amounts of space between this shaft plane line and the club head so when i start to come down you can see that that head is touching that the whole way down the delivery position right there, which is last parallel. Now, all of a sudden, that thing there, you can see how that's parallel to the toe line. So I know I'm going to get a really, a, a relatively straight shot, which is exactly what I kind of got there. And Greg, if you could um, just put a, a trace on the, I forgot to tell you at the start of the show to put a trace on this. And now what you're going to see happen is when I start to come down here, the handle's going to start to work back onto the shaft plane line. And at the strike, the, the, the shaft is right on the shaft plane line uh, that it was established in the address position. So this swing right here, this is a this is a swing that I, I I actually like quite a bit. And if we watch that, it looks fairly simple. Now again, not my fastest speed, but what you can see there is is that the club is not wobbling at the top. It's kind of tracking back down, and all that is because of what I did with this with this gear tie. So what I want you to do is I want you to remember how to do this this how to create this instructional device again. You're getting a 2 foot gear tie. Look you want to see it again. All right, givers, we're going to need a 3. So I got a 2 foot gear tie. I fold this in half just like this. Then about Three inches down, I'm going to twist this thing, three twists, so you can see that like that. Now that I'm going to take this thing, I'm going to pull this out this way, so I'm going to create the heart. This one actually looks more like a diamond, but fine. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take this, and you're going to pull these arms out just like that twist it in that fashion there and now you're ready to go that's what it's going to look like and then when you take it off you just you're just going to unhook un, you're going to loosen that up unhook that and set it down wonderful device that's going to help you get that club in the position that you want now the second part of this is the carrying of the angle so when we see really good ball strikers, and good ball strikers to me, they do a couple of different things. One, the low point of the arc is past the golf ball. They hit the ball on the low part of the club face. I like to say in grooves two and three. When I see players that are getting contact up in, in grooves four and five, that's going to tell me they're chucking that a little bit, a little bit more sweep. They're going to have a little bit of a higher launch angle, and that's going to – that can at times lead to some problems, particularly when you're in thick rough or when you're in a fairway bunker, you can get into some real problems. It can work on the fairway and off of a tee, no doubt. But in those other areas, you can struggle quite a bit. So what we'll look at now is a launch angle. So that one there launched at about 19 degrees. Now, what I want to do is I want to get my launch angle sort of in that 17 degree uh, spot. And if it comes out at 16 or even 15, I'm okay with that because that's going to tell me that I'm going to have a little bit more angle um, in that club shaft as I'm coming into the strike. One of the things that, that you want to do is you want to make sure that the handle is ahead of the club head when you're coming into the golf ball. So if I get this uh, back of my hand onto my gear tie and then I let it go, 
So give me a face on there, Gibbsy. If I let it go and I go here, now all of a sudden, when I get to this one spot, which is like what I like to, to call the butt end of the club into my, my trail thigh, if the head of the golf club is above parallel to the ground, I've done a nice job retaining the angle. If the head of the golf club is below parallel to the ground when the handle or the, the butt end of the club touches my thigh, now I'm going to launch it high, right? So let me do a couple of, of recordings here for you so that you can see what I'm talking about. And again, if you have any questions, what you're going to do is make sure you get them to me. Greg will get them to me just in about 10 minutes or so. So I'm going to record this. Whoops. I'm going to go to a face on. So we'll go to camera two. And then I'm going to record this. Now, this one, I'm going to get rid of the angle. So what's going to happen is I'm going to get up here, I'm going to touch this, and then I'm going to shoot it. And what you're going to see is this one spot that I'm going to pay attention to. So up here and shoot it. That is fat. And going into the woods on the left, if you're playing over a hazard, it's going to go into that hazard. So club is really good position at the top. Now I start shooting it. And when I get to where that touches, that is basically right about parallel to the ground. And if I go one more, now you can see it's below. So where that butt end of the club, where my glove is, it's below that, that uh, parallel to the ground. Now, uh, I'm going to show you one other thing too. So there's the strike. And you see the, the shaft of the golf club right here is pointing right up into the center of the body that has about a i'm going to say it's about a two or three degree shaft lean and the shaft is pointing sort of between my nose and um, my shoulder now what i'm going to do with this next one is i'm going to get my the back of my hand onto this and i'm going to maintain it and watch how these things change so we're going to i'm going to set that at impact we're going to now record this so let me jump over to that okay and now Let's hit this one. Now, again, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put that on there and then I'm gonna maintain that coming down into that strike. The handle of the golf club will be ahead of the club head. And now all of a sudden I got a launch there at 16.7. Now watch how different this is. So I'm gonna go up here like this. Now I start to come down. The angle actually looks like it sets a little bit more in the downswing. And then when I get to that point where the handle is touching the thigh, now I've got that. That's a 20-degree angle there. I go one more. Now we're totally in there. In fact, let's do this. Let's compare that position with this position. And that's right there. So now let me let me erase, let me erase this. And what you can see is completely different um, uh, deliveries right here. The head of the golf club over here is way down here. The head of the golf club here is way up there. Now watch what happens when we get into impact. So we're going to go into impact right here and you can see my hands now are getting up to my other thigh, better known as my lead thigh. And when we go over here and we start to go into this, the hands never get to the thigh. So now we get to impact. That one catches it at impact. This one is just marginally past impact. Let me erase this. And now the shaft of the golf club, if I go up from there, is going to go outside of the, the shoulder. And that's about a 70. So that's about a 13 degree shaft lean at the strike. It probably ends up being about 11, maybe 10, but probably 11. And the reason why I don't want to go through impact is when this golf ball gets hit by the, the club head, that'll slow the club head and it'll actually distort the lean of the shaft. So we're not going to go up to that, but you can see this one. Now this one's going right up into that spot I was talking about before. So all of a sudden my delivery is a whole lot less. Now Gibbsy pan with me on camera four here. Just walk with me on camera four. You can do it. There we go. And now when we start to come up here to what we got out of that launch, now what we get is we get a 16.7 degree 
uh, launch angle, which is what I said before, about a 17 degree. That's pretty close. And all of a sudden, these things are pretty good. 117 miles an hour ball speed. That ball flew 177. Apex did about 81. There were a lot of good, a lot of good things with that. And Gibbsy, if you could bring the the uh, sim full, and there's the shot that I hit there. That one turned just to the left a little bit, but a very very solid shot, and certainly something that um, you're going to be proud of because you wanted to move this six iron. I did 175 yards. I got 177. You know what? That's pretty good. I mean, look, I'm not I'm not making a living hitting golf shots, and that one there, if I'm out there at 177, and I, I mean 175, and I get 177, great. I'm not trying to hit it farther than that. I'm just trying to get that. Ball speed, 117. So let's do one more here. And I'm going to do the exact same thing. So I'm going to try to bring it up here. I'm going to try to maintain that coming into the downswing. And let's see how close we get to the numbers that we had. I threw this one just a little bit. So not exactly the same, but let's look at what we got there. So when I chucked this one and I felt the difference, and one of the things that you have to understand is, is that you're doing these drills. I'm doing these drills just the same. It's not going to be perfect. We're not perfect. So I had 17 degrees, 16, seven on that one. The, the one, this last one, 18.2. So a little bit more than a degree and, and uh, well, let's see, not a degree, a little bit faster ball speed. I chucked it a little bit. So that kind of threw the club head faster than I wanted. I got a little bit more loft in that one. So that one's going to have a little higher apex. That went up to 92. I also got a little bit more club head speed as I showed you, or ball speed rather. I got 118 instead of 117. So now all of a sudden that golf ball went 180 instead of 177. So a little bit past what I wanted. Still a very good strike in the center of the club face. Not perfect by any means, but a whole lot better than the inconsistencies of one that went like that one that I threw it on. That ball went about 135 yards with a six iron. I'm expecting 175. I just got 180. That's going to be on the green. It's not going to be a problem. It's not going to be exactly what I want, but it's not going to be a problem. And again, the apex, 92 feet, the, a 10 foot difference in that apex, I'm promising you, isn't going to make a big difference. So how do we teach ourselves how to do this? Well, one thing that I like to do is I like to separate it much the same way as we did that, that one uh, at the very start, we took the club back. I paused there and then I came down. Well, now I'm going to do the same thing, but this time I'm going to get that feel. This is the second part of the equation. I'm going to get that contact and now I'm going to feel that contact all the way down into the downswing. So I'm going to pause up at the top, got the contact. And now when I bring this down, I'm just rehearsing this like this. And now I'm going to go. And that one, I really held on to it. So that one launched at 14 degrees. Let's try this again. Again, this is the pause. So here, feel it, and then come down. Give yourself that pause at the top. So up here, good. And that one there, 14.9 degrees. Okay, so it's it's a lot lower than the 16.7 and a whole lot lower than when I chucked it. It was leaving it like 20 something. Now what I'm gonna do, and let's just assume that you've done this for a while. Now we're gonna put it into motion. So I get that. And then I'm coming down into that strike right there. Okay, so this was pretty good. I turned the face over a little bit, 16.1 on my launch angle there. So a lot better, a lot lower. That one there launched, as I said, 16.1, only apexed at 74. Ball speed at 115.6. Again, not my fastest that I'm going for. I'm not trying to do that right now. I'm just trying to build this feel. That was a really solid contact. That one there at, what do we got, 14.5 on that one, so really good ball speed at 14.6, 114.6. Now what I'm gonna do on this one is I'm gonna try to give this a little bit more speed. So when I give it a little more speed, I probably am not gonna hang on to it as well as I'm, I'm doing right now in this drill. Ball speed's gonna go up, apex will probably go up, launch angle should get back to that, that 17 degree number that I was talking about. So here we go, let's see how we can do. So up, touch, there, faster ball speed, 
18.4117 on that one. Went the distance I was hoping, 176. And I didn't hold on to it as good as I can do. I got to do, I can do better than that. I will do better than that. More practice, more practice. One more, and then I'm going to get questions. One, two, yeah, all right, here we go. So what you're going to do is you're going to feel the body rotating down when you get that. You got to feel the body carrying the club. Here we go. That was really good. That was a lot faster. So come on up to the to the front here, if you could. And let's just look at what, what the numbers are that we got out of this. Because this one is, again, 17-2. That's where I launch. I'm a 17 guy. I might get a little 16, occasionally get an 18, but I'm, I'm a 17. That's kind of where my number is. Ball speed jumped up to about 121. That was really good. Apex right at 91 feet. Those of you that have watched me know I'm a 90-foot apex guy. Doesn't matter the club I'm hitting. I'm 90 feet. Launched out of 17. I got that thing to 184. Better, much better. And I can still get that ball speed to get faster. But what you're going to do and what you need to, to work on is the improvement of, first of all, getting this angle in the trail wrist and then maintaining that angle in the trail wrist. And this will be universal for all the shots that you're going to hit standard stock shots. There are some times in a bunker where you're trying to get rid of that angle. There are some times in a flop shot where you're trying to get rid of that angle. But for the most part, when you set that angle in the backswing, you want to feel like you're keeping that angle. When you keep that angle, you're going to deliver consistent loft, which will, which will uh, deliver a consistent strike on the face, a, a consistent launch angle, and a predictable distance and apex, which is what you're trying to do and how you become a great ball striker, okay? All right. Now it's time to open it up to your questions. Gregory, talk you, to me. Uh, first of all, you'll be happy to know Alex Post is in the chat. He is. Yep. Our so, boy. Uh, yep. No, he's not having a sandwich. He's having a bagel, but he's he here. is. Yep. Makes me very happy. Uh, Alex, by the way, just so that you know, Alex works with us on a new breed of golf on Sirius XM. And when we were talking about this this morning uh, on the radio show, I said, Alex, you got to make sure that you're going to be here because it's going to help you play better golf. So make sure you now, if Alex, if I need to send you gear tie, well, we'll fold one up and we'll put it in the we'll put it in the mail. But I think you can do that. All you got to do is to go go down to to one of those home improvement stores, Lowe's, Home Depot, whatever you want to do. Find a gear tie, two footer. Everybody, two feet. And by the way, they come in a whole bunch of different colors. You can get them in green. You can get them. You can get them in any color. So I just I have it in this because that's what was in the pack, and I wasn't paying attention to that. But you can do that. And Alex, by the way, thanks for joining my man. And they're probably less expensive than that bagel. Uh, for a two pack. Well, he probably. Do you think he? Do you think he went for the butter on the bagel? Oh yeah. Yeah. Maybe cream cheese. When you go, do you go? Do you go butter in the bagel and then maybe with a little bit of uh, do you kind of? No, put I, some... I don't do butter. I would do cream you don't. cheese. You do but, cream cheese. Yeah, or eggs and bacon. Which would Ooh, be my pre that'd be my preference. See, I see now. I'm not yeah. an eggs, eggs. I'm not that guy. I'm I'm gonna go with a little jelly. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna get jam. some grape jelly, some yeah. strawberry jelly, jam, jam. Yeah, a bagel jam. And maybe jam. even jam. I, not right. bad. Not All right. bad. If you Let's go. Sweet tooth. All right. Yep. This one's from Tim. By the way, Manders having a, a riotous laugh over <laughs> here. So he's enjoying himself too. Okay, go. What do Tim, you got? Is the logo of the glove to the ground through impact a feel or actual? I focus on the handshake with the gloved hand. Uh, and in the backswing, um, the logo. I'm sorry. I focus on the handshake with the gloved hand in the backswing. But logo down is hard for me to wrap my brain around. Okay, so Gibbsy, we're going to need a, a down-the-line uh, camera here. So what he's talking about, and I don't know, again, whether it's left or right-handed. but He's a lefty. So he's a lefty. So now we're talking about this being left-handed, which is going to be his right hand. And most left-handers are dominant left hand. So he's working with his non-dominant uh, side or hand. And so what happens is, is that when you go to shake hands back here, you open the club face. So if I take the club back and I go like this, I open the club face. Well, now you better figure out how to get that down to the ground that way. But here's what I would suggest. And this is why I do this with the trail hand and the trail arm. I'm right-handed. I play right-handed. I'm thinking right-handed. For you, you should think left-handed. So rather than trying to shake hands back here, what I want you to do is I want you, when you take the club back, to feel like your trail palm, your left palm, is pointing down to the ground. And when it points down to the ground, that's when you're going to get that touch of the gear tie to the back of the hand. So you take the club back, 
you go to there and now you go up there and now you've got the touch now all you got to do here is maintain that and get the strike and by thinking about your trail hand the lead hand is going to react in a certain way they're not going to do opposite things i'm not going to get this and have this go like my my trail hand being in a cup position that wrist in a cup position i'm all of a sudden not going to get into a cup position with my lead hand it's not going to happen it'll be bowed which will be the delivery of less loft, which is why you'll start getting more consistent strikes and move that low point forward. And so what I would say is let's bail on thinking about the, the lead hand, your non-dominant hand, and let's think about thinking about your trail hand. Okay. So I want you to think about thinking about your trail hand instead of your lead hand. Okay. Not a lot of people can put that together. Thinking about thinking about. Thinking about thinking about. I know. About. All right, go. Uh, okay, this one from MJP. <laughs> I hear about the throw release. What is the difference between throwing and flipping? Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can get uh, a release from the trail hand. And they're all kind of a throw. There's just different ways to throw it. So I could take a ball. And I can throw it this way where my palm is pointing to the target and I can throw it this way. I can also throw it with my palm up to the sky, which is going to basically wherever your palm is, and then you flip the, the wrist that way, the ball is going to go kind of in that direction. And so what, what I call a flip or a throw is when it's happening before the strike. I don't mind that if it happens after the strike, it's kind of a release. What happens before the strike, it's kind of a throw or a flip. It's the same thing. So let's just, let's put it under wrist activity, okay? Or hand activity, if you want. If I have a lot of hand activity and wrist activity over here, bad. If I have it over here, pretty good. And why is it pretty good? Because the contact is pretty much gone away, right? So if I get in here and I release up this way, as long as I don't release it early or hand activity early, if I do it here, I might get the ball to go up in the air a little bit because I'm delivering a little bit more open face. I'm not going to let the, the face close down. But I the way I would look at it is this. In order for you to strike this, this ball properly, try to minimize your wrist and hand activity on the pre-strike side of the golf ball. And then when you come through, try to feel like the palm of your hand, your, your dominant hand, your trail hand, the, the palm of, of that hand is going to point down to the ground or point to the target. But I don't want you to feel like it's going to point up to the sky. When you start pointing it to the sky, that's when you're probably going to get into some, some, some trouble. Okay? And that's the way I would try to say that uh, in a little bit more understandable terms. All right, Jeet. Okay, this is from MJ in India, who's a regular to the program. Awesome. Uh, back again. Yep, back again. Love uh, it. I, I have been trying not to lose my spine angle in my backswing with one swing thought uh, can you suggest a, a drill for better performance okay so losing the spine angle in the backswing to me has a lot to do with what's going on with forearm rotation okay so for instance uh gibsy we're going to need a, a down the line shot here yeah perfect so if i take my my um lead arm and I move it under my trail arm like this, then I'm driving my lead shoulder to the ground and that will keep me in my spine angle. If I take my lead arm and I rotate it out this way, so watch when I rotate, what happens when I move that out away from me is it lifts my shoulder up. Look at my shoulder right here relative to my chin. When I go like this, it lifts it up. So if I rotate and go like this, now what's going to happen is my lower body is going to sink under and towards the strike line, and I'm going to come out of my spine angle. So the times that I see the, the player come out of the spine angle is when there's too much forearm rotation in the lead arm, what we'll call for a right-handed golfer, clockwise. So too much clockwise rotation, which will pin the trail arm underneath and lift the body out. Now, that's one of the reasons why that would happen. The other reason why that would happen is when you take the club back, you start moving the club outside and your weight ends up in your toes. And now your upper body has to counterbalance that and it stands up. So what you want to do when you take the club back is you want to feel like 
your, your lead arm is moving under the trail arm in the backswing, and the hands, the hand path is going to work more in here. So it's moving, and I don't want you to move it dramatically into the hip. I just want you to feel like, and I'll make up something here, okay? So let me move these golf balls out of the way here. Let's just say that that golf ball right there is 6 o'clock, and this golf ball that I put right there is 5 o'clock, okay? 4 o'clock would be right here. 3 o'clock is here. What I want to do is I want to feel like the lead arm is staying under the trail arm and moving back towards 5 o'clock. And when I start to do that, you're going to feel the hands moving in sync with the body, and you're not going to come out of that, that spine angle in, in the backswing, okay? MJ, I appreciate you joining us once again. We'll always love to hear from you, so thank you for being a part of the show. Make sure you tell your friends about us over here. We love, we're trying to grow our community. You're going to be a big part of it, so thank you very much for, for uh, being a part of it. Gregory? Uh, this one from Brad. Is there a, now a drill to maintain that spine angle in the downswing? There is. So what we're going to do is I got to do a little building. And by the way, when you go to go get the gear tie, you can only find this, this little piece at Lowe's, this little clip thing. So what we do is we step on that, step on that. That goes down like that. And then what we'll do is we'll take two more of these pieces. Let's set this up this way. So I'm going to tilt this in this fashion here. And we'll put that there and put that there. So now what I have is in effect a wall. And what I do is I just put my, my butt up against that. And then all I'm going to do when I come down into this, this downswing is I'm going to make sure that I'm pushing back against that. You can see how when I push back, the legs rise up right there. So you know I'm pushing back. So here we get up here. I have contact between my my right glute and this uh, PVC pipe. When I come down, I'm going to put that left glute on and then go all the way through. And that's how you're going to maintain that spine angle. And if, it, if this tips over, believe it or not, I'm okay with that. I don't, I don't mind that. So let me just get my distance to the ball here. So here I am. So now I'm going to push back, push back, good, clean strike. Very solid hit, 17 degree launch angle again. All the things that I'm looking for are right in there. And there's a definite pushback that happens there. So what I like to do, again, I live at these uh, home improvement stores. Lowe's, Home Depot, I prefer Lowe's because of, because of this little piece right here. This little piece right here, it has changed my building ways. I used to have to get epoxy and then cut to the, I mean, nuts. This thing? It's a game changer. So I just buy a pile of these. And then whenever I'm teaching, I just build it. So I, I lay all that stuff out. I'm sure I'm going to get a, a question that's going to allow me to build something. And so that's what I've done. Get it. It's easy for you. You'll enjoy it. You'll play better golf. And you know what? They also can work as alignment sticks too. So no big deal. Gregory? Fantastic. This You've got some. This one's from Mickey. Uh, are you building that speed with your body or with your arms? Oh, this is a really good question. So, so Mickey, let me take this off. So yes and yes is the answer. So what I, what, what happens is speed comes in the form of a lot of different things. It comes in the form of, of hips. It comes in the form of chest. It comes in the form of arms. It comes in the form of wrists. It comes in a lot of different forms. And so what you have to realize is, is that it's all of it. I can build speed by moving my arms faster. I can build speed by rotating faster. I can build speed by hanging on to this, this angle a little bit better in that wrist and then letting it go through over here. There's a lot of different ways to build speed. And so what I would say is, is that this is the, the simple model that I have in my mind. If I have a ton of wrist activity, I'm going to have a very passive body. So active wrists passive body. If I have passive wrists, I can have an active body. And when I start thinking about active body, I'm talking about lower body, upper body, and the arm. So if I'm going to create a lot of speed, I'm going to make sure that I get this wrist position. I'm going to keep that. And now I'm going to rotate really hard. I'm going to let my arms move really fast. And I'm going to hold on to this angle. And then I'm going to thrust that trail arm that way. And if I, if I 
make solid contact here. This ball should get up into the 125, maybe 126. So that's that's a lot of speed. That's more speed than I'll go at. And typically, I'll go at that with a driver. So not not typically an iron. If I want if I want to get a little bit more out of my iron, I'm just going to get another iron. It's the way I I kind of I kind of work. I, I'm only trying to get maybe like a plus plus five or plus seven out of my out of my iron. But that one there, I, I tried to throw a little bit more speed into. I hit it solidly. So all of a sudden, my ball speed jumps up to 125. That's how. And I've done this a lot. I know exactly like when I'm doing what I'm doing, what I'm going to get out of it. And all of a sudden, what's going to happen? I get a couple of little different things. I get a, a ball that goes a lot farther. That's 191. I'm also going to get a higher apex. That apex got up to 113. My launch angle tends to go up when I do that. And I haven't quite figured that out yet, um, why that happens. Because I know I feel like I'm hanging on to that angle. And for some reason, I keep getting higher uh, a, a higher launch angle, that one there at 19.2. But the point is, it's all of it. So you want more arm speed, you want more body rotation. But what I would tell you is, get used to hanging on to this wrist angle before you start adding all that other stuff in there. When you do that, you'll get to a point where you can, on command, add a little bit more speed and know that you're going to get an expected ball speed, an expected distance out of that. If I'm going that with a six iron, for me, I typically am going to get somewhere between, honestly, like 187 and 197. I'll get an additional 10. Normally, I'm playing my six iron at about 175 to 180. If I want a little bit more, I can stretch it to about 185 to 187. But if I really go at it and I get that 125, 126, that's what I kind of expect out of that, like 190 to 195. That's sort of where I'm going to get to. All right, Gregory. Okay, from Joey. Uh, I have heard that slower swing speeds need less shaft length. Is that true? Well, I would say it this way. Slower swing speeds have less shaft lean. Faster swing speeds will have a little bit more shaft lean. Now, that's a general statement. That can change. That can change depending upon shot shape. So if I'm trying to hit a little a low cut, I'm going to have more shaft lean. If I'm trying to hit a high draw, I'll get I'll, I'll have a little less shaft lean. So shot shape has a lot to do with it. But as a rule, and it has to do with a simple thing. If I have the shaft leaning backward, I'm just going to make up a number here, okay? So so these are not exact, but this will give you an idea. If if this club face has just simple math, it doesn't, but simple math. 40 degrees of loft. If I lean the shaft 10 degrees forward, I now deliver 30 degrees of loft. If I deliver the shaft backwards 10 degrees i now have i now have 50 degrees of loft so i got i'm going to go from 40 to 30 and 40 to 50 well if i have 50 i'm hitting a wedge so in reality my 8 iron is going to be somewhere around that 40 degree loft number it's typically about uh it might even be a little less than that but point is if i have 40 and I lean at 10, I'm going to have 30 in the delivery, and 30 in the delivery is going to launch a little bit lower, and it's going to go a little bit farther. If I have 40, and I deliver, and I throw it, and I come in with 50, now all of a sudden, I've got a pitching wedge. Your pitching wedge isn't going to go as far as your 8-iron, and as a result, you're going to get a slower club head speed. You're going to get a slower ball speed. So what I would say is, is that I like to have shaft lean, and with shaft lean, I'm going to get a little bit faster club head speed, and I'm going to get I think dramatically uh, faster ball speed. Okay. Now dramatically isn't 30 miles an hour, but it is plus five to, to eight miles an hour. Okay. Okay. This one from Ethan, does this drill differ with the driver? How long would you want to maintain that angle and impact? Um, it doesn't differ with the driver. So um, let me, let me get a driver. I'm not going to put that, that thing on, but I am going to show you something that will make, um, some sense to you, I hope. So, Gibbsy, I think you can keep this right on the face-on angle here. You don't have to worry about it, okay? So, this ball right here is my ball position for, let's just say, a six iron, okay? And if I come in the six iron like this, the shaft is going to be forward of my, no, stay back up here again, sorry. The shaft is going to be forward of, of or at my lead hip. When I put a driver in here, 
So we go to there. And that shaft is to that same spot. So this is pointing to that spot and this is pointing to that spot. What you're going to see is, is that there's just left less shaft lean because what I have is I have this ball position here, which is closer to my nose. And then I have this ball position here, which is closer to my shoulder. And so what I would say is, is that ball position has a lot to do with that. You want to uh, chuck me a T? Yeah, good call. So great job. So what I got is I got, I'm going to, and what I'll do is I'll record this. I'm not going to put on um, my wrist thing, but what I am going to do is, is try to make a swing with this driver so you can get an idea. And this might not even be picked up by the, by the sim because I don't know that I have it in the hitting area, but here we go. So it did. It picked it up. Now, come on over here and let me show you what I, what I mean. So, so you can see in the address position, my ball position is obviously right there, which is just inside that heel or right off my shoulder. And now when I start to come into this, you can see the, the, the delivery of the club. Remember before I said to you that, that the butt end of the club at first touch is going to have the, the head of the golf club above parallel? Well, that's where I am right there. So that's the same thing. A lot of bend in the wrist, a lot of bend in the, in the trail elbow. Now when I start to come into the strike, what you're going to see is, is that at the impact position, there's the shaft of the golf club. And it's pointing over there. Now, what you're going to say is, okay, well, what did that look like relative to the iron? Well, so let's just let's just see. I don't know which one I've, I've, I'm demonstrating here. So that's the old one. So this is this one. So now we come up here and watch how how watch where the positions are. They're going to be almost I, identical. It just passed the strike there. So let's just go to there. And now I come up here like this. And what you can see is, is that they're virtually the same. That line is virtually the same just past the lead shoulder, just past the lead shoulder. They're going into the hip, but they're sitting at different angles because of the ball position. So my delivery position is pretty similar. My hands are going to be a little bit more forward because of ball position. The angle of the forearm is going to be a little bit more parallel to the ground because of ball position. But the delivery is going to be virtually the same. It's virtually identical. And you can see the shaft of the club pointing here, just a finger past the, the uh, shoulder and the same position over there. So it's a very interesting thing. It's kind of like, you know, one of the, one of the, um, one of the interesting topics of conversation with my students when they first learn this is that all clubs virtually apex at the same height. So your driver will apex at about 90 feet if your six iron apex is at about 90 feet and your pitching wedge will apex at about 90 feet. But because of the apex where it is uh, relative to how far away it is from you, like my pitching wedge, which goes about 135 yards, the apex of that, again, I'm just making this up because I don't know this, but the apex of that pitching wedge might be at 100 yards. And because it's at 100 yards, my six iron, the apex might be at 150 yards. And all of a sudden, because it's 150 yards, it doesn't look as high as the pitching wedge does because the pitching wedge apex is closer to me. And the same thing is true with the driver. The apex of that thing will be 90 feet even though it will look like it's not because it's really far away from you, it still is. That's one of the things that people go, wow, I didn't know that. This is another one of those, that the position of the, the extension of the shaft will basically be in the same spot. If I have a pitching wedge, it'll point to about that same spot. If I have a sand wedge, it'll be about at that same spot because the ball will be moved back. So this delivery, as you ask that question, same exact thing with all clubs provided that we're trying to hit just our standard shot, not trying to do something specific like hit it lower or hit it higher or hook it or draw it or what up, it, whatever. Okay. All right. Great question. All right. From this one from Alex, for those of us that don't have immediate access to a launch monitor and our numbers, what's a good way to visualize what our sweet spot 
launch angle looks like? Um, there's a couple of things that, that you can do. And again, this now you got to understand how I, how I work. I try to take responsibility for things that I'm doing and I try not to go, well, that's called an excuse is one of my favorite quotes is of all of mankind's great um, inventions. The excuse is the worst right now. I'm not saying Alex that you're making an excuse, but what I am saying is, is that you can find this. All you got to do is make some phone calls, check around. Is there a place that, that is near you that has a launch monitor that you can hit balls on for a little bit. Maybe it's public. Maybe there's a, a, a place where you can go get a lesson with somebody that has a launch monitor or a simulator. So you can find this and you can learn about this. And what you have to do ultimately is you've got to train your eye. It's the hardest thing to do. You got to train your eye. And when I hit a shot now, I stand there. I know where the ball should be. I find, they call it windows. You hear people talk about this all the time. They call it windows. And so what I do is I find the window. I find where the ball should be. And I know what I'm delivering based on what window I, I'm, I'm predicting. So when I hit a six iron, I look up. When that ball is in the window, I know I've done a good job. When that ball is below or above the window, I know something's going on. Maybe my ball position, maybe my weight distribution, maybe my distance to the ball might be off a little bit. There's all kinds of things that can affect where that golf ball is relative to the desired window or to the expected window. And what I would say is you got to find out what your window is to know where you are. So what I would say is don't just say, hey, what do I do if I don't have that? What I say to you is, you know what? Go find a place that has that and see if you can't hit balls on there and find your window. Now, one of the questions that would be a follow-up to that is, well, what if I don't have the consistency of the strike to be able to get anything out of that? Now we're in a different position. Now what I say is go down to Lowe's, get yourself a, a, a gear tire too, put one in the bag, put one at your house. They come in two packs. The two packs are what? Seven bucks, something like that. Yep. So Go get yourself a two-pack, stick one in your bag, stick one at your house, work on this a little bit, get used to this feel, start hitting the ball. And when you start going out there, we don't need to know what the apex is. You'll know if the ball's kind of in the same window every single time. And when it is, now we can go over to that guy and find out, well, what is that? What is what is that apex? What is that launch? Oh, is it really 17 and 90? That's what Breed does. That's awesome. I got the same thing. Whatever. doesn't matter to me. What matters is, is that you take responsibility for that and you don't fall back on the easy thing, which is, well, I just can't get there. Yes, you can. You got to work at it, but yes, you can. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Uh, this one is from Scott. Um, something I continue to struggle with. Uh, if I'm, I'm a left-handed golfer, but I'm right-hand dominant, should I focus more on the lead hand flexion? Um, I, what I would do is I would experiment. So the answer is, if you're a left-handed golf and you're right-hand dominant, then give it a try. And then what you're going to do is you're going to do the opposite. You're going to rotate this thing down underneath so you feel a little bow come into that, that, right, that right hand. And then when you, take that up, when you take that up to the top, now you're going to start to feel. Do you feel the bow better than you feel the, the, the left hand? Do you feel your right hand better than your left hand? I don't know. I, I think what will happen is, is that over time you'll, you'll discover it. But what, what I am... I'm also a big, a big fan of allowing my students to experiment. I call it self-discovery. And through time, and I would say, don't just hit five golf balls and go, oh, you know what, that stinks. I can't do that. I would do it and do it and do it. Hit 30, hit 40, try it over a couple of weeks, see what happens. And what you might find is over time, you know what, I can think about the left hand or I should think about the right hand because I'm a lot better with it. And you'll see it, it'll re be reflected in your shot shape. It'll be reflected in the impact point on the club face. You'll get, you'll start to understand whether you're able to hit that ball a little bit more solidly with a left hand thought or a right hand thought. But I would open up to, you know what, try both and see what ends up happening. Okay. Okay. Uh, this one's from JM. Uh, in a earlier video, you talked about um, when you were hitting some drivers, uh, how a toe, how some people say that uh, getting toe contact can give you more speed. And JM's wondering more speed than what? More speed than a center face hit? Um, um, can you explain that? Yeah. So what I would say is this. I wouldn't say that if you hit it in the toe, you're going to get more speed. That's not what I said. What I said is, is that if it's slightly towards the toe, 
you can get a little bit more speed because you're going to have, you don't have to be uh, fingernail precise when you're striking the golf ball. If you're off a little bit towards the toe and a little bit higher in the toe, that can be a fast spot on the club face, particularly with a, with a driver. Okay. Um, so what I would tell you is I'm not saying that you've got to strike it out on the toe. I'm just saying if you miss the strike and it misses to the toe just a little bit, it can, it can work out quite nicely. So, um, one of the things that will happen is particularly if you're an open face player is you can accelerate the toe a little bit. You have to accelerate the toe if you're an open face player. And many times when you accelerate the toe, you can, you can pick up a little bit more club head speed. It's not what I advise doing, but you can pick up a little bit more club head speed when you do that. So what I would say is, is that, and I, I would, I, I would definitely say this, you're going to be better off hitting it towards the toe than hitting it towards the heel. There's no shank towards the toe. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Okay. This one from Jay. Uh, when you were playing as opposed to practicing, what are you thinking? Are you thinking swing mechanics while you play? If not, what are you thinking about? You know what? That's a, that's a really, really good question. Um, and this is, this is one of the great debates that uh, is held amongst teachers and all, obviously teacher player. So what I would say is this. I personally, I like to play with a swing thought, but I always have a shot shape in my mind. So what I do when I play, I'm going to hit a, I'm going to hit a cut here. So I'm going to feel like I'm taking that club a little outside and then I'm going to rotate my chest through the shot, but I'm still seeing my shot shape. So I'm going to go right there. I'm going to start it right there, take it outside and rotate. And so what I get is I get a shot that's going to start sort of on the edge of that bucket, and then it's going to fade over to the target. Now, I am thinking about, and, and by the way, don't give up on that, Greg, because I want to I want to show people. If you can go back to 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 that, and I'll I'll pull this down because I want to I want people to to see what what happened with the shot that I just hit. So I had a path of that golf club of one degree out to in, which I need to do in order for me to get the the golf ball to kind of start left and fade. And then my angle of attack will get a little bit steeper. So all of a sudden I'm, I'm striking down on that. But what you'll also notice too, and gives you, I don't know if you've got four up in the corner, but what you'll also notice too, is that with that open club face, what I got now was an 18 degree launch angle there because my club face was a little bit open. So now if you pull the, the uh, sim full, what you're going to see is, is that the golf ball started to the left, just slightly to the left of that basket that's out there. And then it twisted over to the right. So when you hit a fade, you got to get the face open. When you get the face open, now all of a sudden you're going to get a higher launch angle, which is why mine went from 17 to 17.9 because the face is slightly open. And so what I can tell you is, is that I hit the shot that I wanted to hit, but I hit it because I, I had a swing thought that I that I like to execute. Now, I like to, to think that way. That works for me. Everybody's different. What I will tell you is this. Whether you like to have a swing thought or you don't like to have a swing thought, never give up on the visualization of the shot you're trying to hit. Not the shot you're afraid of hitting, the shot that you're trying to hit. So what I like to do is I like to go, okay, I'm going to hit a cut. I'm going to take it outside. I'm going to rotate my chest coming through. That's going to leave the toe behind. And it's going to create a cut. But I'm looking at where do I want to start the ball and how is that ball going? And I can see it start and I can see it finish. And that golf ball will reflect something close to what I'm hoping to hit. And so what I would say to you is you always have to have an image. You have to find out whether you're more successful with a swing thought or not. I am. That doesn't mean that you will be. It means you got to find it. Simple like that. Okay. All right, Gregory. Okay. This one from Michael. How do you play a hole you generally have issues with? Uh, on a par three, do you play for four? If it's a par four, do you play for five? How do you fit your shot into a hole that you don't play well? Um, okay, I this is th I love these questions because there's a lot of mental stuff in here, okay? So what I like to do and what I like to tell my students when they're having an issue with a given hole, and let's just say it's a, a par three, one of the things that I like to do is to tell them to play a different tee box when they get to that par three. So if you normally play the whites, then go and move up and play the, the uh, red tees or the more forward tees, the next tee up. And what happens is, is that you'll invariably have a different club in your hand. 
you'll likely be teeing off from a different tee box. And so you're going to see this hole in a different way. So that's one of the things that I like to do. And then after you've done that for a while and you've started to have some success with it, now alternate and, and get used to alternating. The other thing that, that I like to do is I like to, I like to give my mind an excuse at times. In other words, let's embrace the fact that this is a hard hole for you. Okay. So let's just take down the expectations. And I don't want to say a par or a bogey, I, get rid of the number and let's just put ourselves back on the range. So what I like to do is I like to just get a high target, like a tree and go, okay, all I want to do is hit it the tree, whether this goes into the water or whether this goes over the green or it goes onto the green. All I want to do is I want to hit it at the tree. And don't judge yourself on the outcome as far as did it get on the green or did it not, but judge it relative to did you hit it at that tree? And all of a sudden, the lesser expectation allows for better improvement. And then as you start to do that, you'll start to find that you hit the shot more successfully and now you'll be rid of the demon, okay? So move up a box, Get used to doing that. Don't care what your score is. Don't care about what everybody else is saying. I I'm, Literally, I, I don't care. I tell them, hey, guys, I'm going up here. And they go, well, you don't get a shot here. Okay, great. I don't care. You want to discount my score? Great. No problem. I'm going to get over this problem. Okay? So move up. And then when you go back, pick high targets. And then what you're going to find is you're likely going to be more successful picking high targets and stick with that. High targets are great. They help remove all of the images that are negative images and you start getting some positive images, you start to feel like you're on the, on the practice team. And then the one other thing that I would tell you is this. So again, I don't know this par three clearly, and I don't know what club you hit clearly, but what I will tell you is, is that par threes are the closest to the range that you can get. They're the closest to the range that you can get because you're hitting off of a level lie, you're hitting an iron most typically, and you're hitting to a shot, to, to a start line, okay? Which is basically what I'm asking you to do when I say pick a tree that you're going to aim to. It's a start line. When you go out on the golf course and you struggle a little bit with well, why can't I get my range success to the golf course, it's because when you're on the golf course, you ask for both distance and direction. When you're on the range, you're only asking for direction. And distance is a big deal. Well, what happens when you have lack of success on a par three is you're asking for yourself, putting way more pressure on distance than direction, which is why I want you to pick high targets. Because now basically what we do is we remove the distance equation and we get back to direction, which is exactly what you're doing on the practice tee. So concern yourself with the direction and practice that on the practice tee. In other words, if it's a six iron shot for you, before you go play your round of golf, you're going to hit a number of those six irons at a tree focusing on the direction. And then when you get to the golf course, you're going to go, hey, I've done this a ton of times. I was hitting my six iron great. And now I'm just going to focus on the direction. Pick that tree over there. Boom. And I'm telling you, you will solve the problem. Okay. Another interesting question. Gregory. Okay. This one from Nick. Right now, I know I'm casting and losing a ton of power. But when I try to hold lag, Currently, I hit everything off the hosel. I normally play a slight draw, but every uh, everything swing uh, every, every swing right now is over the top and swinging left, creating a major slice when I do hit the face. Any okay. help would be appreciated. Okay. So what I would say is, is that in this particular situation, what's happening is when you're trying to hold this angle, you're holding this angle and you're not rotating the body properly. OK, what you're doing is you're trying to hold the angle and it's almost like you're holding off everything and your body isn't rotating. Your arms and hands are moving across your body. And what I want you to do is I want you to feel like your arms and hands are staying on the right half of your body. So you can go ahead and stay in a face on shot here, Gibbsy. So what I want you to do is when you take the club back, your hands get to the right side for the right handed golfer. They get to the right side of the body. So what I want you to do is I want you to get it to the right side of the body and then keep it to the right side of the body. So right now, my chest is over here. My hands are back here. And so if you let you, if you hold on to the angle, but let your arms and hands get to the left side of the body, you're going to hit a shank. So what's going to happen? You're going to hit a shank because you're going to be out and over. But if you get in here, keep it to the right side of the body and let your chest and your, and your lower body rotate out of the way. Now what you're going to get is you're going to get a very strong draw without a lot of effort. You're going to get a very solid strike 
without a lot of effort. And so what I want you to do is I want you to feel like you're going to get your hands to the trail side of the body or the right-handed golfer to the right side of the body. And then you're going to keep it on the right side of that body and carry that through so that it's still on the right side of the body. It won't be, but it will feel like that. And the club will now lay down underneath. You'll bring it from the inside and you'll get a really good strike. Okay. 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 This one from Gary. Uh, why do you use the six iron for your demonstrations? Oh, I love this question, Gary. That is awesome. And I never typically, I will not say a great question, but I love this question. Why do I do six iron? Fabulous. So here's what happens. Loft masquerades shot shape. Loft can masquerade shot shape, which is why many of you take your pitching wedge and you hit your pitching wedge and you actually like, most people like one of three clubs, pitching wedge, nine iron or eight iron. That's typically what you're going to practice with. And that's how loft can masquerade what's going on with the shot. But once you get to the six iron and seven iron can still do it as well. Um, it's just one of the things that's happened in the game of golf is there's no universal loft on, on these clubs. And so what happens is, is that uh, sometimes it can be a seven iron that can, that can work like a six iron, but all six irons uh, can work sometimes seven iron, but all six irons can work. And so what I like to do is I like to use six irons because six irons to me, they create, they don't create a lot of backspin, which means side spin can be a big factor. So let me show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to get a pitching wedge here. Actually I'll go nine iron, but Gibbsy go up to the front for me. Take that four and go up to the front. Ah, I didn't get a good number. I only got an eight. Okay, my fault. I didn't look at that. All right, so I'm going to hit a shot here. I'm going to hit a six iron here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to create a, some side spin. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Now, Gibbsy, what I want to ask you to do here is pull the sim full after that shot. So that shot's going to, going to uh, clear up here in about two seconds. There you go. So there's... There's what you have out of that shot shape. Now, what that shot tells me is my club face was wide open and it doesn't tell me a lot about my path. It just tells me that the face of the club was open and I started at a little right of center and then it, it faded to the right-hand side. Now, we come up here and we look at these numbers here and I got about 1,100 RPMs of, of right spin and my backspin jumped up to 6,300. I typically don't get 6,300 RPMs of uh, backspin with a six iron. It's typically for me about 5,400, somewhere between 52 and 5,400, okay? And my side spin is typically, and it's right, but my side spin is typically like somewhere between two and 400. That's that's where I typically play, okay? But I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna walk you through this and I'm gonna hit a shot here and I'm gonna show you what's gonna happen. So what happens is my backspin goes up because my side spin was so massive and my side spin was so massive because the club face was open, which is why that ball only went 165 yards, why it launched at 20 degrees instead of 17 degrees, in spite of the fact that my club head speed was 80 miles an hour and the ball speed was about 115. Normally 115, I'm going to get about 172, 173 out of that, out of that distance. And then the apex went up to, to 95. Now, what I want you to see here is this. By the way, Greg, I don't know about you, but this is one of my favorite shows that we've ever done. I'm, I'm the, the interaction, the questions, the, it, this is, this is honestly one of my favorite shows I've ever done. If you all um, have had a chance to watch part of this, or you got into this a little bit late and I'm not doing this because I'm trying to get, you know, views on my thing. It, it's because it's a real learning opportunity. Go back and rewatch this. There is so much in this particular show, more so than any show that, that we've done. Uh, so just go back there and, and, uh, and watch it. Tell your friends about this. Cause this has been, this is without question, my favorite show, um, that we've done. Now, what I've got is I got a nine iron. I'm going to try to create another 1100 RPMs of spin, but what I want you to remember and gives you, if you could pull the sim full again, what I want you to see is how much curve there is in that shot. So that ball starts about, uh, I'm going to say a third of the way from the right edge of that and it curves over one, two, three uh, mower lines. Okay, so a curved three mower lines starting in the middle of this other one. It might even be close to four mower lines. Now what I'm going to do with this nine iron is I'm going to try to create 1,100 RPMs of right spin. 
I don't know that I can do this, but I'm going to try to do this. Okay. All right. So here we go. So we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting. Okay. I didn't quite get, I didn't quite get that massive number. On this one, I got 722. So almost got the 1100, but I got 722. Now, the backspin on this one is 8100. The club face, it still was open. We know that that was open. Look at what the, the shot shape is. And what you can see is that one there didn't fade more than one cut of the mower. If you look at the dark green patch of the mower line, it started inside that mower line and it finished inside that mower line. So it started on the left edge of the, of the target and it came down about where the six iron um, finished or, or started as well. So that ball did not move the distance of the, of the target. And it had 722 RPMs of spin, of side spin, which isn't identical, but it's nearly identical. That one there would need, in, in, in order for me to get as much curve with the six iron, I would have need to have tripled the side spin or quadrupled the side spin, which would have had that side spin at about 2,100. It's impossible. It's literally impossible. So loft will mask the curve. So if I hit that shot out on the range, go back to that shot again, Gibbsy. If I hit that shot out on the range with a nine iron, I'm going to go, you know what? I'm hitting it pretty good. That looks pretty good. It's not really curving a whole lot. It looks pretty straight. I like that. Well, if I do that with a six iron, the thing's going to be going off the globe to the right-hand side. And if I do that with a driver, if I get 72, if I get 720 RPMs of right spin with a driver, and my driver normally has about 22 to 2,400 RPMs of spin, that thing is going to be in the woods faster than you can say, I'm going to hit a provisional. It's going to be that bad. So the reason why I use six irons is because it's got the, the enough loft to help me and it doesn't have too much loft that it dis, the, distracts me or distorts the shot. And that's why I use a, a six iron. It's a great question. All right, before we end this, and I can't thank you all enough for being a part of this. I ask you to do, to do one thing. Please tell your friends about what we've got going on over here. Follow us, join us, be, become part of this community. We're growing, we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and we're trying to do that so that you can play better golf. That's honestly the motivation here. And you all who have been with me for a while, you know what I'm about. It's not about anything other than let's have fun playing golf. Let's smile. Let's enjoy our lives. And the amount of time that we have on this earth, let's enjoy it playing the game of golf and playing a little bit better than, than uh, we had been playing a little bit you know, before. So that's what we're about. Tell your friends, watch us, join us, interact with us. We love it. That's not, I'm not saying that you have to buy a poker chip. I'm not saying that you have to get a hat, but if you're interested, you can do that. Our poker chips, we got five different poker chips. You can send in an email to us and be a part of the, uh, get one of these poker chips. They're six bucks. The hats we're selling as well. Um, and all you got to do is send those to me at newbreed of golf at michaelbreed.com. So I want to really thank you all so much. Get the message out. Tell your buddies about us. Also too, I want to thank my friend Steve Gibbs and obviously Greg Ducharme for all the hard work these guys do. Give them a chance to, to say thank you again. And what are we going to see out of this? We're not going to get anything. Oh, we're going to get a fist pump. They almost forgot about it. These Just guys, the basic. you know what I got? I got I'm constantly coaching these guys. It's a never ending. Anyway, um, we appreciate you all so much. And remember, join us tomorrow morning on Sirius on a new breed of golf. That's 8 a.m. And we will be on CBS Sports. Uh, about a, uh, at about 1.30 Eastern on CBS as it leads into the coverage of the RBC. Um, Greg, just quickly, who's leading the RBC right now? Is it uh, still is it still Harmon? No, no, Victor Hovland passed him. He Victor. shot seven under. He's done in the clubhouse with 64. Okay, there you go. That's one yeah. of my choices. Yeah, and I bad had one. Yep. Do you have Hovland too? Oh, I liked Hovland. Yeah, I know you did. Yeah. I just wasn't sure if he was in your Fantasy Five. No, he wasn't. Every Wednesday, we do a Fantasy Five guys on a new breed of golf, and Greg gives us his insights. And by the way, the consistency of his picks. When we have our picks on the show, we all kind of, you know, choose who we want to who we want to pick. Greg has been going last for about four years, and he is leading <laughs> the league. I mean, I'm at I'm at like 380 points. He's at about 1300 points and Billy is way down the list. We're all kind of chasing the leader. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me if Greg had picked Vic and, and he also, I know you picked Cantlay and I know you got 
uh, Chris Kirk, and I know you got um, you yep. got Matt Kuchar. Yep, I got Kuchar in there, and you got a couple other guys too. Yeah, uh, Sung J M. Sung J M is yep. in there too. Yeah, yep. who so Shane Lowry. So oh one. yeah, Sugar Shane. Yeah. Yep. That's another good pick. Anyway, so we're having a lot of fun, fun in all of our different platforms. And over on CBS, by the way, we have a great interview with Dave Phillips. You want to make sure you join us again. That's 1.30 on CBS Sports. I want to thank you all so much for joining us here on A New Breed of Golf Live on YouTube. Please tell your friends about us, and we will see you next Thursday right here on YouTube. Have a great weekend.